Hello everyone, this is Matt Affleck here today for MyPokerCoaching.com and today's video we are going to be talking about mastering your stats, how to win more, analyzing your game and using stats properly in poker. So this topic's you know come up over the last few years, poker has become way more of a science. Um, I'm not much of a chess player at all but I like to consider it a lot more when I'm describing to people that don't play poker. Poker has become a lot more like chess, where the use of AI and playing against uh, computers um, is become one of the most effective ways to study. Um, stats can help, you know, not only learn how to exploit your opponents, but as well as analyzing your own game. And I think people focus on stats a lot with uh, exploits rather than using stats to properly analyze their own game. So I think the most important tool that anyone can have for an online poker player is Poker Tracker or Hold'em Managers. And I think they're kind of a non, um, they're, they're essential, they're non, uh, that's the word I'm thinking of, you, you can't get without them. So uh, today we're going to talk about the most important stats to begin with, some of the basic stats and how to interpret them. So we're going to start off with preflop stats. Um, in my opinion, preflop is the most important street in all of poker because it happens the most frequently. So the first uh, four or five stats we're going to talk about are preflop stats. Uh, stat number one is VPIP, very common term in poker, which stands for voluntarily put money into the pot. It's kind of one of the most basic of all stats. Um, and what this stat does, it includes all the situations or opportunities where you can put chips into the pot um, minus your blinds or antes. So blinds and antes are forced bets. So what the stat is, is every opportunity you have a chance to add money to the pot, which is either like raise first in, you could call, uh, three bet, uh, fold to a three bet, any times where they, the first action for you to enter the pot, uh, it takes all the opportunities and how often you enter the pot versus not enter the pot. Um, and that gets your voluntarily how often, what percentage of hands are you playing, essentially. What this doesn't include is when you're in the big blind and the small blind limps and you check. Because you didn't put any additional chips in the pot, your big blind was a forced bet. Um, so if I'm playing online, uh, VPIP is one of the first ways, like most basic stats on any HUD that you're going to use. Um, solid players, VPIP will fluctuate between 20 and 30 percent. So all these numbers that we're going to be giving throughout for all these stats, they're very dependent on format. You have tournament formats with antes, you have cash game formats with no antes, you have six max, you have full ring. So all these stats are very uh, flexible in terms of what is acceptable. I'll try to touch on it when I can. Um, I would say tight players, you're going to be looking at a VPIP of like 16 to 20 percent. Looser players, uh, you're looking at like 25 to 30 and then like whales or like really bad players you're gonna see that 40 to 50 percent or more statistic um, I would say VPIP alone will not identify skill level of opponents uh, but it gives you a good kind of base work so I'll try to on all these stats give a basic you know way I would use this stat and one basic way I would use VPIP is if I have a player that's playing 45 percent of hands I'm looking for every way possible to get into the pot with that player so I'm gonna call looser three bet looser play more hands than I should and the reason is is because that's gonna probably lead to that player being a weaker player and I want to play a lot more hands versus that player versus a player with a 15 percent VPIP this player is extremely tight and I'm gonna be uh, you know the counter would just be to not give them action since they're not uh, properly playing enough hands where we are not going to give them action that's kind of our exploit in that situation uh, preflop stat number two is raise first in kind of self-explanatory how often the player raises when they're first to enter the pot so this doesn't count when someone is open in front of you or limped in front of you it's when you are the first player to enter the pot and no one else has entered the pot uh, voluntarily before you uh, winning players will fluctuate around 20 to 30 percent of a raise first in. Um, let's say raise first in is greater than 30 percent are far too loose, although you can get away with slightly above that number. And raise first in of less than 20 percent is far too tight. Um, so you can use this stat to determine how wide you should call or three bet versus opens. Um, raise first in is often very much used with VPIP so you might have someone say this player was playing a 2719 
that would mean they're playing 27% VPIP and a 19% raise first in, or they're playing 1916, playing 19% of VPIP and 16% uh, raise first in. Uh, a common way to identify weaker players from stronger players is how wide the gap is between their VPIP and a raise first in. Now, most people that have studied a little bit recognize that aggressive play is what's really important in poker. So the closer the VPIP and raise first in numbers are, the uh, more probably studied aggressive the player is. So if they're playing 27, 21, they're not calling as much there. Most of the hands they're entering, uh, because they're playing 27% of hands and raising 21% of them, most of the hands they're playing are coming in the form of a race for sin. They're not open limping and they're not calling a ton. Um, a player that's playing like 35, 10, where there's that big gap, they're playing 35% of hands but only raising 10%, I'm going to probably immediately mark that player as a very weak player. Um, they're going to be calling too many hands, playing too many hands, and they're playing them in a very passive, um, not aggressive way. Uh, third stat is 3-bet, again kind of a self-exploratory um, explan ah, explanatory <laughs> term. Uh, how often the player re-raises when facing an RFI? Again, this stat is based off of opportunities. So, uh, it's when uh, a player has raised first in first, how often you're three betting. It's not how many three bets you have off of total hands played. It's only the times when someone has raised first in in front of you. That counts it as one opportunity in yes or no, did you three bet. Um, again, these numbers depend on formats, full ring cash, your 3 bet percentage might be between 3 and 6% because there's no antis and you're playing 9 handed. Um, tournaments, when there's antis and smaller raise sizes, you're going to see a 6 to 10% being a more standard 3 bet stat. Short handed games are going to have a lot higher 3 bet stats. Um, it's important here, I will note with 3 bets, is you really want to look by position. Uh, you might have someone with a very high 3 bet stat, let's say like 10 or 11% in tournaments. But maybe in early position, they only have like a 2 to 3% three, 3 bet, but on the button, they have a 20% 3 bet. So a lot of people are very positionally aware, and uh, you can look at their positional 3 bet stats, break it down even further to how much they 3 bet the button or small blind or the cutoff. Um, is a pretty important way to use the stat and analyze your own game as well. Number four, fold to 3 bet. So fold to three bet, again, kind of self-explanatory, but a very important stat. Um, many players fold too much to three bets. Um, if you have a fold to three bet stat and you see someone is folding more than 60% of the time to three bets, it's likely a huge mistake and you can just kind of print money by three betting them way too often. Um, the fold to three bet stat is often way correlated, is very correlated to their RFI. So if someone has a very high raise first in, they're likely going to fold more to three bets because their ranges are wider. And if someone has a really tight raise first in, they're likely to have a very low fold to three bets since they'll show up with stronger hands more often. So um, as you'll see throughout this you know, video, uh, there's a lot of correlations between stats. Um, so if you are if you are folding too many to three bet, uh, too much to three bets, if you notice that, two options are to raise first in less or you could also four bet more often. Um, so take a more aggressive way to uh, defend against those three bets. Uh, the final preflop stat, which is maybe the most important, fold to steal. So what is a steal? A steal is any raise coming from late position. And late position is defined as the cutoff, the button, or the small blind. So fold to steal is how often a player folds to raise first ins from, this, from uh, steal positions. So uh, the button fold to steal is how often they fold to cutoff raises. The small blind fold to steal is how often they fold to cutoff or button raises. And the big blind fold to steal is how often they fold from cutoff button and small blind raises combined. Um, so in cash games with, now, with no annies, you know, if you're folding 70% or more of your big blinds, um, maybe even more than that, uh, you're making a big mistake. In tournaments with antis, folding more than, you know, 40% is very, very costly. Um, the big blind is the most important position in all of poker, and the small blind is the second most important position of all of poker. Um, due to the massive pot odds you're getting and the forced bets, um, you have to play a lot of hands and reduce your loss rate as much as possible um, when you're in the big blind and the small blind. 
Um, and so looking at the fold of steel in two ways. One, making sure you're not folding too much to steels and you are attacking or defending against these wide opening ranges against the button. You need to play wide ranges yourself. And if you have this on a HUD or you notice an opponent that has a very high fold of steel, well then you should start raising more than any GTO start chart uh, suggests. You should be raising um, very, very wide preflop since they're going to fold more and you're going to end up making more money post flop since you're over realizing your equity when they fold. So that's uh, it for the five preflop stats, um, basic stats to start with. And let's get into some post flop stats here and then we'll talk a little bit about how we can tie this all together. So post flop poker stat number one is C bet flop. Um, so most people by now know what the continuation bet is. It's raising after you raised preflop. And C betting is a critical part of the game. Um, if you C bet too often though, your checking ranges become weak and attackable on turns and rivers. If you don't see that enough though, you allow opponents to realize too much equity. So learning proper C betting frequencies is very important. Um, depending on the format, again, tournaments, cash games, shorthanded, full ring, uh, antes, no antes, how wide ranges are. Uh, a C bet flop stat around, you know, 60%. Um, in tournament poker, I would say your, your C bet flop stat should be around 70%. It's going to be lower in cash games since ranges are tighter because there's no antis. Um, and a cool, uh, you know, a cool little exploit here, I said higher at low stakes. In low stakes or against weaker players, you should really jack up your C bet frequency because weaker players are going to A, fold too much on the flop and not check raise enough and all those things are going to lead to your c-bets being more profitable in every situation uh step number two fold to c-bet so the opposite of c-betting when you're facing a c-bet you don't want to fold too much to uh flop you, don't, you can't fold too much on the flop to wide c-betting ranges again ranges are very wide um, I think people focus a little bit too much first on the ranges. Um, in my framework for decision making, the first thing you want to focus on is pot odds. So first, pot odds, second, the ranges. And I don't necessarily meaning calculate what the pot odds are in terms of, ooh, I'm getting four to one, five to one. I just like to look at, mm, this player bet 25% of the pot, okay? Um, when they bet 25% of the pot, you should be calling 70% of the time. You should, your majority of your answer should not be fold. You should be looking for reasons to call, not for reasons to fold. If this person bet three quarters pot, well now you're going to be folding you know, upwards of half the time, somewhere like that. When they bet much larger, you fold more often. And so versus very small bets, it's very important to look for reasons to call, not for reasons to fold. So the most important thing when you're facing a C-bet is the bet size. Again, it's format dependent. Um, Flop, fold the flop c-bets around 40 to 60 percent depending on the formats um, fold more versus players with low c-bets or low v-pips because they're going to end up having tighter ranges so if you have very tight players betting you're going to fold slightly more than um, a different type of player because they're going to have a stronger range versus very loose players you're going to call more because they have weaker hands or maybe you raise more uh, you want to defend more so um, again, we can tie in pre-flop to how we, we want to uh, decide our post-flop strategies. Post-flop number three, C-bet turn. Uh, frequency, the player who last raised before the flop, that's the turn. So how often this player raise pre-flop, bet the flop, and then bet the turn. So a double barrel on the turn. Um, the, the important thing here is the initial raiser already has information on the flop. The player didn't raise them, uh, they called on the flop or they folded. So we can kind of remove the top hands from the range, we can kind of remove the bottom hands from the range because the top hands are likely to check raise, the bottom hands are going to fold, and they're left with kind of the middling hands. Um, winning players tend to have a c-bet turn stat around 45 to 65 percent, um, slightly above 50. Uh, I normally tell my students somewhere around 55 percent in tournament poker. Um, and yeah, you want to be very aggressive on the turn and attack the capped middling range that the player that just called the flop likely has. Um, my note here is be very careful turn C-bet versus players with low flop check raise. 
Okay, so again, we're connecting stats together. So a player who doesn't check raise the flop enough likely comes to the turn with a much stronger range than a player that is check raising their good top pairs. Um, for example, like let's say the flop is king seven deuce. Um, a computer output might say this player should check raise king queen, king jack, king ten. But if a player is calling with king jack, that's going to affect our turn strategy because now we want to bet less on the turn because they have a stronger range since they have hands like king jack or king ten that a computer output might not think the player is capable of having because they should check raise those hands on the flop. So um, the check raise flop strategy or how often they fold on the flop is really affecting how we see about the turn. If they fold a lot on the flop, we're going to see bet less on the turn because their their range is too strong. Um, we're not going to put the money in for them. Um, that's how we kind of punish them. Um, stat number four, went to showdown. So WTSD went to showdown is the acronym there. Uh, how often a player gets to showdown with cards face off? So basically, what percentage of the time are cards flipped over on their back? And what this stat is kind of good for, um, and I'll, I'll use this stat sometimes in a situation, is so first, you know, winning players are going to have something around like a 20 to 30 percent um, went to showdown. A low number is going to indicate the player likely folds too much in a hand. So at some point, whether it's the flop, the turn, the river, they're, they're very, they're folding way too much. Um, and so that player is going to likely get to showdown with a stronger range. Um, so we have to be careful um, by the river bluffing them, but I'm likely going to bluff heavily on flops and turns, uh, maybe rivers depending on the player, because they're not getting a showdown enough, they're likely folding too much and playing too cautiously. But a player with a very high get to showdown, um, this is likely indicative of a player that is very sticky and calls way too much. So these are the types of players you don't really want to fold against, or sorry, you don't want to uh, bluff against, and you want to really value bet thinly against these players, because they're getting a showdown way too much. Um, and with it, the only way they can do that is if they're getting two showdown with way too weak of hands. And stat number five is correlated. This one is one money at showdown. So this is the number of times the player wins any money at showdown. Now, the player could still lose money overall, um, but they're getting some type of return at showdown. So a low number would uh, indicate this player is likely bluffing too much or call too often so if they're not if you know at the bottom here you say I say winning players are winning around 50 to 65 percent it's 52 to 66 percent when it showdown so if this player is winning 40 percent of the time they're either a pretty big calling station and calling too much or they're bluffing way too much and they're getting to showdown with way too weak of hands but a high number if you're winning at 90 percent of your showdowns you might think that's a good thing, but it could be a bad thing because that's indicative of a player that might be too tight or fold too often. Um, and they're getting to showdown because you're always getting pot odds in poker. And so you, you're supposed to call with hands that are not going to win 50% of the time because of pot odds. So if you are winning too much at showdown, you're likely missing hands that you should be calling. Um, and aren't because you're playing too much of a yes no game do I win or do I not versus what are my odds of winning this versus what are the pot odds laying me in this pot so um, one money at showdown is an important stat to look at um, number six aggression percentage by street um, so many players are too passive on later streets um, turns and rivers they tend to play way too passive and we want to have an aggression percentage to be at least 30% on all streets. Um, low numbers is probably indi uh, indicates that there are missing value bets and also bluffs. Whereas high numbers would indicate um, lots of bluffing, bluff raising, um, thin value bets, um, a more aggressive player. So it kind of gives you a ballpark of is this a passive player or this is a aggressive player. And you will have players that like... The reason we do it by street is you might have players that their overall aggression number looks fine, but you might see that they have 100% aggression on the flop and then like 15% aggression on the river. So they, it can vary a lot by street. Um, our final one is river call efficiency. Um, this stat's a little weird because it's a ratio and the middle ground is one. 
Um, so it's the ratio of how many chips are returned for every one chip invested when calling river bets. So if you put in one chip on the river, you for that chip to be profitable, you have to get more than one chip back, right? One chip would be uh, break even. So if that number, the number should never be less than one because that means you're just calling $10 to win $8, right? That doesn't make sense. You, you, you want to call $10 to win at least $10 um, on the river. Um, pot odds, because like, the money in the pot is kind of a sunk cost for that bet, okay? So, um, uh, if the number is lower than one, you're returning less than one chip for every chip you invest bad. Again, this is a ratio um, stat. And if the number is very high, like more than two, that might seem good, but it also means you're probably calling too tight and missing light river calls um, due to pot odds. So you, um, I said earlier, the, the um, money in the pot is a sunk cost. It's not exactly true with this stat because it, it's a sunk cost stat, or I'm sorry, it's a ratio stat. So you're looking for something between one and two, like um, if I'm looking at a database, somewhere than something between like 1.5 and two, and a really high number might be you're not calling enough on the river. A really low number is likely meaning that you call too much. So before bluffing the river, for example, you could use this stat to see what this person's river call efficiency um, is. and it can give you, um, you know, a, a look into how likely that your bluff to, is to work, or how thinly you can value that versus a player. And in reverse, you can use that stat when you're reviewing your own game to see how you are calling on the river. Um, how to study um, using these stats? I think most players study way too sporadic. They're way too random. In their study, so you don't want to you want to avoid random study at all costs. You want to have focused, intentional study, yeah. And so, you want to like identify leaks. And when I say identify leaks, it could be potential leaks. Maybe you see your C bet stats off, or maybe you see your three bet stats off. It doesn't mean you're necessarily making mistakes, but it's an area to look further into. Um, and then with Poker Tracker, which is the program I like to use, uh, Holder Manager is a good program as well. I'm just not as proficient in them. It's like Hold a manager and poker tracker kind of like Apple versus Microsoft, just different um, um, softwares that can do the same thing, they just do it a little bit differently. Um, so you can filter hands down for every time, if you notice your 3-bet stat is too low, you could filter for every time you have a 3-bet opportunity and see, pull up some you know GTO charts and see what types of hands that the computer is saying you should 3-bet that you aren't 3-betting. Um, and then you can study those hands. Or maybe your river call efficiency is very, very low, so you can filter for all hands where you call the river bet and then see if you're calling too loosely in all those hands. Um, that's how I would do effective, efficient study rather than like a random, sporadic study. Um, if you put in the hours, you can learn to self improve. Using stats is like a very, very good way to go about doing that. Um, in summary, stats are great beginning place to identify potential leaks in your strategy and then to know where to dig in further. Um, use your stats to direct future study sessions. Um, a good thing is look at the stats of the biggest winners in the game and see what the biggest winners are doing and, um, and then try to uh, mimic those. Um, and online versus live this is why I've always said that like online poker is truly like if you want to get really really good at poker I think you have to play online because of the ability to have all these stats and databases of hands to review hands it's uh, very very important in terms of your skill development in, in poker um, so I'm a big proponent of online poker um, the final thing I'll add on the summary here is um, the interconnectivity of all these stats you know um, your preflop race first in is very uh, indicative to how often they fold to c-bets in the flop. So if you have a player that folds to c-bets way too much and does not check raise, you can raise more hands pre-flop because all those hands are going to be more profitable on the flop now because that player is not c-betting or they're folding too much on the flop and not putting enough aggression. So y your fringe opens now are making a lot more money. So there's a lot of interconnectivity of all these stats and e everything kind of leads back to pre-flop in how many hands you could play 
and trying to expand to be able to play as mo many hands as possible profitably is kind of a goal because then you're generating as many situations that you can be getting in um, these spots. Um, I guess the final summary too I would add is the weaker the players, which you can identify the stats, get into as many pots as possible with the weaker players. Um, look for reasons to call, don't look for reasons to fold against these players uh, pre-flop. Um, that's it. Um, thank you everyone. Please like, subscribe, and I will see you guys again next time for mypokercoaching.com.